when I was asked to come and do something at the Royal Academy of Music, which I was very happy to do, having visited the year before and having had a very nice concert of my music put on, um, and I was asked for if I'd accept a position here, I decided that I wanted to, um, I was asked if I wanted to name the position after somebody, and I decided that I would like to name it after Richard Rodney Bennett, who was a musician who did many things. He didn't just compose. He, you know, he wrote movie music, he played jazz, he, he, did, he did all sorts of things, and he was a, um, um, non, uh, was not a dogmatic man. He was a practical ma man, he was a practical musician. I can't do half of the things that he did, um, but I'd like to think that what I do here is in the spirit of what Richard would do, is I like to think of myself as being a sort of consultant shrink who comes in maybe you know once or twice a term and sees, um, sees composition students and gives them perhaps a perspective that they don't get from their own teachers, not, not because their own teachers aren't giving them good perspectives, but because it's a di just simply because it's a different perspective. Also, I get to work with the Manson Ensemble, um, this, this very, uh, this excellent uh, uh, um, contemporary music ensemble that, that works from, uh, that's been at the Academy for years. And I've had a, quite a bit of experience working with young people um, on this sort of music from, from many, many years of working at Tanglewood. And I like to think that I can bring a little something of that here. So that fundamentally is what, is what I do. I'm a mixture of, 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 of I'm a sort of consultant of a very strange kind. What's impressed me the most about the composers that I've, that I've come across here, and it must be by now a couple of dozen, I would have thought, um, is that they're all writing stuff that's very, very different. Um, there's, there's no uh, orthodoxy of thought. There's no orthodoxy of approach. There's no sense that everybody's, uh, you know, that there's, a, there, there's no sense of cliqueism of different composers falling into little groups. And that falls right into with my picture of the way music ought to be right now, which is uh, which is not. I'm not a great fan of of, of crossover or commercial music of, 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 of any kind. However, I do like to think that um, different kinds of music, different kinds of serious music, of art music, should be able to coexist um, today in the same way that different kinds of music coexist in our musical memory because of recordings, which is a, a, a situation that wasn't, that wasn't the case before a generation or two or three ago, um, when you only heard new music. Nowadays, uh, uh, new music is as immediate as music that was written 700 years ago. You have, everybody has access to everything, and, and composers have access to that as sources for what they do. So the more the, the wider the, the 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 wider the scope of the um, influences or the you know the, of the, of the the effect that different kinds of music have on the young composers, the better for me. And that seems to me that that's precisely what's going on here. When I'm at home <laughs> and people come and visit me up in um, up in Suffolk, um, I tend to hold forth about a lot of music up there because I have a very large library and I have a large collection of recordings and I know a lot about a different, uh, just having been around a long time, about very different kinds of music. And it occurs to me uh, sometimes that some of the younger composers don't know some of the music that's important to the composers that has been, that has been important to the composers of my generation. Um, by which I don't just mean the 50s avant-garde, I mean, uh, I mean, th things that were, uh, let's say, huge battles in the 1960s and 70s between different types of music, which now all seem to be part of the same sort of thing. And I thought it would be a good idea, maybe, if I was to talk from time to time about some of these pieces that were seminal for us as young composers in the 60s and 70s, even in the 80s, I guess, 
for some of the composers in the, now in the 21st century who don't know, um, they might know the pieces, but they might not know what the significance of those pieces were. Uh, secondly, there are pieces about, pieces of music about which one has thought for many, many years, because I've known them since I was a, a little boy, like the Sibelius Tapiola I talked about a few, uh, a few weeks ago, um, or the Britain Cello Symphony, which my father played in the first performance of a few weeks ago. And I think sometimes that, um, from what I read, analyses that I read about these things, that for me they missed the point. I have a more of a practical musician's and a, a more of a composer's viewpoint on, on maybe a, a, a way of analyzing these things. And uh, this week I want to talk, t technical things permitting, about a piece of music that nobody in the room, possibly uh, uh, Philip Cash and, and myself, accepted will have heard uh, to get a reaction from um, the young young composers in the room for something that is absolutely fresh to them and that namely a, a, a work by the dutch um, polymath musician i must have said must say reinbert de Leeu. his work de nechtelijke wanderer which is the first piece he's written really of any size for 40 years, which is a very remarkable thing anyway. And it's remarkable in many ways. And it's just a way of giving these talks. I never thought I'd do this sort of thing. I'm just sharing, I sound like, sound like Dame Edna Everidge, just sharing of sharing. Maybe some things that I know with, with something that they wouldn't find out otherwise.